What's up audit fans, Dr. Amanda here. And today we're going to be doing a big fan request, which is looking at auditing inventory. Today I'm going to specifically focus on the inventory process um, and understanding auditing inventory for wholesalers, not for manufacturers. For manufacturers, I'll get into that in a different video. So let's get into it. Now, a big shout out to all of my regular subscribers, um, especially we've had viewers comment from Argentina, Malaysia, India, Uganda. Uh, so a big hi to everybody around the world. I'd love to hear where you're from. Drop that in the comments. So my name is Amanda. I do love audit. I teach audit to undergrads at a major Australian university. And today we're digging into auditing inventory. This one has been requested a lot. So let's jump into my tablet. So auditing inventory is really important for businesses that sell something, all right? If you're a service firm, inventory is not such a big uh, deal, banks, etc. But if you sell a physical good, uh, whether that's phones, phone cases, uh, umbrellas, clothing, inventory is going to be really, really important. And as I mentioned before, today I'm going to talk about wholesalers. So that is organizations that buy inventory from someone and then resell it. So realistically, for a wholesaler, they have a process of needing to purchase inventory and they do that from the manufacturer. All right, and so there's a whole lot of costing issues obviously that go into making inventory and then they are going to resell it to other wholesalers, uh, you know, online stores. Uh, so, you know, these types of organizations are normally selling to retailers, all right? Or potentially you could be reselling it to customers. Okay, so I'm just talking about inventory that's fixed, boxed, um, comes already organized. So in terms of looking at the controls here, controls really come from the controls over the purchasing process. And I've certainly uh, looked at processes and auditing around um, how do we order something. So certainly around the purchasing, there needs to be some sort of purchase request. That usually needs to be approved. Normally then there will be approved suppliers. Um, there needs to be orders, obviously, so the approved suppliers. Often you might have a separate purchasing department that might do all of these types of ordering and other types of tasks associated with purchasing. Then the goods have to be received by the client. So they you know, come to the warehouse, you have to check how many do we have, is this something that we've ordered? And then after that is going to be a process for payment. So when you're auditing purchasing, you're going to be auditing, I guess, the transactional side of inventory because inventory is, is really interesting in a way that it hits the financials in terms of transactions because I know that when I sell something, I go debit cash or accounts receivable and I go credit revenue. But then I also make the transaction that says debit cost of goods sold credit inventory. So when I'm auditing other parts of the financials, when I'm auditing revenue, um, then I'm also probably going to be auditing that cost of goods sold side. And then I'm going to indirectly be gathering information about inventory. So today I'm actually going to focus on really the balance side of inventory. And that balance is at the end of the financial year, the balance of inventory has to go onto the financial statements. Bless me, sorry about that. I don't think I took my allergy tablet this morning, so this could be really interesting. All right, so I'm gonna be looking at the balance of inventory rather than looking at all of the individual transactions that go into that. And you'll be auditing that in other parts um, of the client. So now let's write down all of the assertions that we need that go with inventory.
Okay, so here we have our assertions. So these are our balance assertions. Remember these come out of ISA 315, I think it's paragraph A128, 129, I'll be double sure to check. But existence, completeness, accuracy, valuation, allocation, rights and obligations. So we're going to look at each of these in turn. So let's start with existence. Does the inventory uh, really exist? Is it really there? It says it's on the balance sheet. So we know that for existence, this is normally a procedure where we would use some vouching. All right, so vouching typically means we need to start at the records, the accounting records. So we're probably going to vouch a, let's say a haphazard sample of inventory items from, now, how the inventory is recorded, where it is stored, could be in any number of different sort of terminology uh, types of places. So you could have an inventory listing, there could be some sort of register of inventory, but it's gotta be some sort of recording in your system of all the inventory. So I'm just gonna write here from the inventory listing, but it could have a different name at your specific client or in your specific jurisdiction and match to physical items. Now, of course, oh, this could be a little bit difficult if you have got software that sort of doesn't really count in that same inventory way. I'm thinking about physical goods here. So you want to match to the physical item. And that might be, if it's unique enough, there might be some sort of um, barcode or serial number. Now, if you're looking at inventory, it's something really big, like a car or a computer part that has a specific serial number, you can do that. If it's just tennis balls, then that's gonna be a little bit different. But you wanna make sure that the inventory actually exists. So there is actually a proper name for this type of process where we check the records and we wanna make sure that everything that is actually listed as inventory is really there. And so one of those is a stock take, all right? Now, when it comes to stock takes, Sometimes if it's very high value inventory, we will count it ourselves, if it's diamonds or something else. If it's a supermarket chain, then the stock, may, stock take might be a process that you observe, all right? So you might observe the client staff, oops, I can't spell there, counting inventory. All right, so again, this observation process is sort of a bit of a test of a control where you're going to be you know, finding out, look, what's the plan to test inventory? How do you train people? How do you make sure everything happens correctly? And then you're observing the staff as they're doing the stock take. So you could observe staff uh, stock taking and counting the inventory. Now, of course, there can be some complications. Inventory that is far away, inventory that you might not, uh, you know, might be dangerous to look at. I don't know if it might be nuclear fissionable material or something. So for us, we want to find out where is the inventory held? How do we actually count it? Um, if it's goods that are individually serialized, is there some sort of barcode scanner that we could use here? So we want to observe, count, look at the items. One other thing to be really careful of when we're testing existence and something that's come up as a result of COVID-19 has been the idea of using live streams. That is, you know, the client staff are at their warehouse, um, they're wearing, you know, perhaps a GoPro or something stuck to their head or strapped to here, and you're in contact with them and you can see what they're doing when they're doing the counting. When it comes to live streams, it's really important that you ask to see inside any boxes. All right, because, and this is, you know, <laughs> this is a fraud trick as old as time, create a whole lot of boxes and they could be empty or they could just be filled with, you know, something that's broken or something else. And say, look, yeah, we have heaps of this particular item. So you want to make sure that if it says it's there, we're looking at the actual product. So that also mean opening some or checking them to make sure that they're reasonable. So now sometimes that's difficult. I audited a company that made um, steel products and I couldn't necessarily look at like this big roll of steel out in um, the holding area and go, oh yeah, this is exactly this particular type of product. So sometimes when you're checking the existence of inventory, it might also be useful to get advice from an expert, especially if it's a highly unique product. Now, some things I could 
tell a can of baked beans. I could tell what a frozen chicken looks like. But sometimes with specialist equipment, we might need to actually get some specialist advice to make sure that we're checking the existence correctly. So existence vouching. Start from the record. Make sure that the physical item exists. Now, the other side of that is completeness. Because remember, existence is an overstatement thing. Companies are more likely to overstate um, their inventory. So the other thing that we need to look for, I guess, when we're looking at uh, existence is also, and I'm just going to make some more room here, so I just need a tiny bit more, is we want to examine for any damaged or broken items. All right. And that'll link through a little bit later on to our accuracy and valuation. Well, that's a bit of a thick line there. I want something thinner. Um, because broken items will later on help us, oh, look, this needs to be written off. This is overvalued. So existence and that valuation tend to go together. So now let's dig into completeness. When you've stock taked, if you've stock taked at a company before, you might be given a list of the items as an employee and said, count how many and write it down. Now that is actually a completeness test. So that would be tracing. So that would be counting items and match to the inventory records. Now remember we have to do both because we're worried about overstatement and understatement. So I need to you know, count, it says there should be 20, I write down 20 and then later on we check it to the records and we find out, oh, there should be 25. So we've identified that there's some um, overstatement there. But also we want to look at items and say, look, is this item actually on the list? Now when it comes to supermarkets, again, it's, it's more likely to be the existence issue than the completeness issue, but we want to do both. So a stock take involves both. Start from the list, work back to the item, and pick a random item in the factory and say, oh, do I find this on an inventory listing somewhere? So you could count an item and match to an inventory record, or you could haphazardly select items and match to the inventory record. All right, and that will help you make sure that if there is something that they made that maybe didn't get recorded in the inventory, that somehow you've picked that up. Now, of course, when you're looking at completeness and you're looking at items on the floor, the other thing to be aware of, and I'm gonna sort of skip down and then I'll come back to accuracy and valuation, is that we actually own them. So we have the right, we wanna make sure that we confirm ownership of the inventory. So we need to be really careful there if we have any goods that are on consignment. So selling goods on consignment might be that, uh, for example, uh, you know, Auto Junior has this phone. He doesn't have a phone, but somebody, somebody has a phone. They say, Commander, I want to put this phone in your shop and I want you to sell it. Um, but you won't own the phone, you'll just be holding it for me and then you'll get a commission. So if you do find inventory and you think, oh, okay, I don't see it on the inventory listing, one of the things to check would be, is it on consignment to make sure that you own that inventory? The other thing around rights and obligations, of course, is inventory on order or inventory in transit. So an inventory, you've ordered it, it's on its truck on it on the way to you. The question is, when do you take ownership? So that might mean that you'll need to, uh, you know, record inventory that you physically don't have on premises if you own it as soon as it gets on the truck and it gets to you. Now, of course, that's not going to be terribly accurate, but you still need to record it. The other issue is inventory that has been sold, but not delivered yet. So sold on the last day of the year, we know that the sale doesn't happen until the uh, inventory is delivered to them, but we wanna make sure that still, we still own that inventory until that point, so we need to make sure it's recorded. So that's our rights and obligations. We don't have too much in the obligation side, it's more on the right side. 
So let's go back up now to accuracy, valuation, and allocation. And so AVA is it often is abbreviated to is accuracy is the costing of the individual product. Valuation is the value of the entire account and allocation is going to be, do we have any non-current inventory? So allocation is going to be current v non-current. All right. So in terms of valuing inventory, typically the first thing that we need to think about is the inventory valuation method. So you need to check whether the inventory method that's being used is acceptable within your jurisdiction. So for example, FIFO, weighted average, uh, LIFO. So you have to pick out which one, oh, look, they're using a method that's not appropriate or that is an appropriate method. So you have to first understand the inventory valuation method. Then you're going to need to look at the counts. All right, so you're going to take, um, so we're going to need to recalculate, oh, I can't spell here, inventory valuation using audited quantities of inventory items multiplied by audited purchase cost. Now, of course, that's really simple, assuming that you know, everything was purchased for the same price, but you're gonna need to figure out what inventory is still in existence that was there, how much was it purchased for, and is it valued correctly? So that's gonna be a little bit of management accounting there. Now, I'm just gonna make a little bit more space here because there's a few other things that we need to do in terms of accuracy, valuation, and allocation. And that other one is going to be that we need to find out, is any inventory damaged? Is any inventory broken? Or is any inventory lower in value? All right, because remember, we have to use the idea of lower of cost or net realizable value. So, you know, you need to look at these things and say, if it's a fashion warehouse, um, are this, is this particular product still in fashion? Can we still sell it? Can we still get the money for it? So with the damaged or the broken items, that's going to come from a lot of observation. You look around, oh, this item is supposed to be on the inventory list, but I find that it's broken. That needs to be written off. So we need to make sure that damaged and broken inventory is written off. And we also have to make sure that for any inventory that is declined in value, it's not popular anymore, it's out of fashion, that we need to write it down. Now, the general retail rule is that you buy something, you sell it for at least four times the price. So it's pretty rare that inventory is going to go down such a significant amount that you're going to need to write it down in value. Now, when it comes to allocation, most of the time, inventory is current, right? You plan to sell it in the next 12 months. The only time you might have non-current inventory might be goods that you're holding or things that need to age. So sometimes that can include things like wine, which you know goes into the barrel for you know wine, or spirits that might need to uh, go into a barrel for 20 years, etc. I can't actually spell spirits there. Let me try that again. Spirits. So you're going to need to look at those and say, is this you know something that we're holding for a long time, um, and make sure that any. Um, inventory that you don't plan to sell until more than 12 months time actually sits in a non-current inventory type of situation. And that's you know reasonably rare and it only sits within a couple of different uh, industries. Now there was one other test or one other thing that I thought is a really good um, substantive analytical procedure that works really well with inventory that helps us identify whether we've got an issue with existence or completeness. And it's sort of, I guess it doesn't really fit neatly within either of those, but this is a, a type of analytic that I would do quite often. So a substantive analytic would be to use your management accounting information to help you understand whether the numbers look correct. 
So for example, opening inventory, so let's go opening inventory plus what you buy, all right? Less what you sell should give you the closing inventory value, all right? So if you can make sure that opening inventory, if you can confirm that from last year's audit, so previous year audit purchase, you can audit, get that audited from the purchaser side. You're going to get audited information about sales because you're already you know, gathering that evidence. And then you can compare your calculation of what you get for your closing inventory and compare that to the client records. All right, and then you can say, oh, okay, well, I started out with 100. I purchased then 1,000. Then I sold 800. So that should give me 300 in closing inventory. But when you actually go and you do your inspections, your stock take might discover that you've only got 200 in the item. So the question for us, is where did the other 100 items go? Were they stolen? Were they broken? What has happened? So I can also use this substantive analytic procedure to help me identify overall what might be happening. I can also use substantive analytics to help me with my accuracy valuation and allocation. So if we dig into AVA, I could do things like uh, days in inventory. So how long, and we would do that per product, how long does it take me to sell something? And if there's something that's been, you know, really slow, so either days in inventory or inventory turnover, because they essentially tell you the same thing, just in different um, calculations. So days in inventory or inventory turnover per product, if you've got days in inventory and it's very high, you might say, oh, look, why are we holding on to this for so long? How come it takes so long to sell something? If inventory turnover happens to be very low, that might be something that is slow moving. Now, of course, you need to make sure that you customize this for your industry, because if I'm selling Aston Martin sports cars, that's gonna have low turnover anyway. Um, and if you saw low turnover, you'd be like, oh yeah, that, that makes total sense. However, if you are a supermarket and you're selling chicken, um, or you know, fresh meat, fruit and vegetables, you'd expect the inventory turnover there to be reasonable. And if it was really slow, you might think, oh, something is, is going on here. So you can actually you know, calculate one of these ratios for all of the product lines. And then if they're in Excel, just do a sort. Um, and you'll be able to find what's moving the slowest, what's moving the fastest. And that can also help you get some insight into uh, auditing that specific account. And that can also help you narrow down because remember, rather than checking your entire population, a really smart idea is to stratify. So then you could have potentially high, medium, and low value items. You could stratify based on fast, average, and slow moving items to help you identify obsolete inventory. So work smarter rather than harder here. Now certainly there are some challenges when it comes to inventory. Inventory that's located far away, inventory that is spread out all across the country. You know, when it comes to auditing supermarkets, for example, the auditor can't go to every single supermarket here in the country for a particular chain. So then it might be testing internal controls. What are the controls around stock take? Uh, do some sample counts yourself. If there is inventory in cities that you don't have an office in, you might look at hiring a component auditor, somebody who can go to that um, particular place and gather that particular evidence that you need. Now that is not a fully comprehensive list of every single audit procedure related to inventory that you could do, but here are some examples to help you get started. Remember, you always need to customize your audit procedures to the client, the industry, the scenario, even the year with COVID-19 where we've had uh, observing inventory through GoPros, live streaming, FaceTime, all sorts of different things. 
If you do have a great audit procedure you'd love to share or you want to check whether it seems like a reasonable procedure, drop it in the comments and I'll get back in touch. Of course, if you haven't already, I'd really appreciate a like. If you haven't, click subscribe to get up to date audit content. I want everybody to stay safe, stay well if you're still learning and studying remotely like my students are here in Australia and I'll chat to you next time.